thank you so much for having me. What's crazy is I speak to thousands of people about the future of work and speaking to enterprise companies, and I'm way more nervous talking to my peers here because this is a little unscripted, so bear with me. Um, so my name is Caitlin McGregor. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Plum. We're based out of Waterloo, Ontario, though I spend a lot of my time in Toronto going back and forth. Um, and I've been really lucky to have people uh, come and work for us in, in Waterloo. And so tonight I want to share five lessons that I wish I knew sooner. And so I've been at this for a while. Uh, as Alex said, I built two businesses for other people before starting my own. Um, one of the things, it's not even the first five, is almost never trust people when they say how long they've been running their business for because it's kind of relative. So I could say that I've been running Plum for four years uh, because that's how long we've been branded as Plum, but I've actually been doing this for about seven and a half years. And so these are things that took me a while to learn and boy do I wish I learned them a lot sooner. So I'm going to go through a bunch of them. The first one is that I wasted way too much time going after small to medium sized businesses. So I ran two small businesses before starting my own company, so I understood the use case. Um, so I started Plum to help democratize access to highly predictive data, to take best practices from industrial organizational psychology, marry them with technology, and help small businesses hire better, because that had been my own use case. And so I went after small businesses like my own, and you know, this is great because small businesses, you can close the deal in a day sometimes. Maybe at most it takes three months to close a business, so really short sales cycles. The problem about small businesses is that you are chasing every startup. You would have been my clients four years ago, so I'd be trying to convince every single one of you to, to use my company's product. The ACV, the annual contract value, is really small. Most people starting their own small business you know, like they've got maybe $99 a month to spend on your tool. Uh, they're definitely not going to spend $100,000 a year on your, on your company. There's tons of noise. It's so easy. All of you can go after small businesses. It doesn't take much. So there ends up being a lot of noise. The small business will get 100 emails in a week about the different services to help small businesses. Um, so there's a lot of competition, so you're really fighting for that mind share of that person. And so it's really hard to prove breakout success, that you're the customer, sorry, you're the business that that customer is going to pick over all the 99 other options they have. And typically small businesses tend to churn, so you lose small businesses quite rapidly. Whereas enterprise, enterprise businesses, for at least the lesson I learned, is that's the answer to my company's success. The pros are high ACV, so high annual contract value. You can easily start with over $50,000 in a single year, and you have huge expansion pro uh, possibilities. That $50,000 contract can grow to $100,000, $200,000, $500,000, maybe, if you're lucky, even get to $1 million. Whereas a small business, you're pretty much capped out unless they're going to turn into an overnight success. Um, there's less startups to compete against, so every time you hear on your news feed about another startup in your space, well, unless they can handle enterprise security, you know, they're not going to be your competition. The cons are your product has to be well built, can't have a whole bunch of bugs in it. You use sales cycle are six to eight months, and then you got another three to four months of security, privacy, and contract process on top of that, which is tough, but it's well worth the reward. It's simple math. With small businesses, you need about 2,000 customers at $3,000 ACV a year, annual contract value, to get about $6 million. Enterprise companies, you can do the same thing with 60 customers. Lesson two, I'm not going to get through five. This goes a lot faster than I expected. Go where your competition can't follow. It took me a long time to realize I needed to get out of the very crowded space of talent acquisition into an underserved part of the market, which is talent management. I'm able to take my same core IP and repurpose it into an underserved market, and I can go where my competition can't follow. I figured out that we built our technology to scale where we could go to a part of the organization that was completely underserved by our data, which was the middle 70% of organizations were untouched by psychometric data, which allowed us to uniquely solve talent management problems. And so you may have the right idea, but maybe not the right approach with go-to-market. Now, the next part is enterprise businesses. It means that enterprise investors, so enterprise B2B investors, 
they're looking for different proof points. And so when we switched to enterprise, it meant that what we needed to prove changed. So we needed to show repeatability. In the early days, that literally could mean only three enterprise companies. If you can th show repeatability with three enterprise companies, fully rolled out, you know, fully paying you, that they're referenceable, they can get on a phone with an investor for three, for three, uh, with an investor, that's huge. You don't necessarily need more than that. As you get higher levels of funding, you need a lot more than three, but maybe 10 is enough. So you don't need huge volumes, you just need really credible references. Um, you need to know how you can beat the competition, so that was the last slide, understanding where I can go and my competition can't follow. Pricing, get, you've got to get those contracts above $50,000. They care about the conversion rate of your pipeline. They care about the adoption, how many people in the organization. That's great that you have the logo, but really how many people are using it? And then year over year growth. You've got to be at least hitting that 100% year over year growth, and that's a bare, bare minimum. Lesson four, series A, then and now. So we heard earlier about there's lots of money. Go after the funding. OK, but what are the milestones in our brains? Because a series A in 2010, it was $6.7 million. In 2019, the average Series A, and the, I translated these to Canadian numbers because we hear the US numbers and we're like, that's not so bad. Translate it to Canadian dollars, $20.7 million is the average Series A. So the next time I hear a company saying that they're doing a Series A and they're raising $5 million, you'll know why my face is turning red because I think we're setting up our community for the wrong expectations when you see numbers like this. And so the reality is, is there are always exceptions, and lucky you if you are an exception. But if you're trying to be inside the box to be checked for a Series A, again, translate these Canadian numbers, you're looking at $4 million in annual recurring revenue. You can be an exception if you're doing 200 to 300% year over year growth. If you got to 3 million in ARR and you were bootstrapped, then you are gold. Um, if you are in an underinvested space that people all of a sudden think is hot, there's lots of exceptions. Last lesson is it's simple math. All of this comes down to math. So there is a lot of investment happening right now, but the bigger funds need to write bigger checks. So if the fund is 130 to $660 million, which is the most active funds, they can't deploy small checks. They can't have thousands of little startups. They need to have less. Just like selling to enterprise companies, you need less. And so making sure that we understand when we say they can't you know, there's lots of funding. Is funding existing in your category? So those are lessons that I wished a lot, I had learned a lot sooner and would have saved me a lot of time and energy. My name is Caitlin McGregor. We are hiring in Waterloo, so would love to have you look us up. Thank you. Okay. Question. No questions. Question. I'll start. I, I've got the mic. It's Alex. Oh, sorry. So, Hi. you know, hey, you're, you're based in Waterloo. You talked about the difference in A rounds. So, well, I'll pick on the ecosystem here, but do you look for fun? Did you look for funding here or do you look for funding in the States and why? So I looked everywhere, um, absolutely everywhere. Um, and if you can find funding in your own backyard, you have a huge advantage because a big, big part of fundraising is pattern matching and is building trust. And so people in Canada, when you can win their respect, then you're not an unknown. Whereas you go to the US, you are very much an unknown. So the bar is that much higher. But there's a lot less options in Canada. So there was a time in my fundraising where I kind of exhausted all of Canada, but then I had to hit more milestones, hit, hit you know, accomplish more of these things, and I had a new opportunity to get on the Canadian radar. Um, so even if you move out of the Canadian ecosystem, you can always come back. And I was able to get benefits from both Canada and the US. So I would say, go after both. Just make sure that your expectations are aligned with the stage of the investors. And so one of the things with the Series A being so high, that means that there's a lot more seed rounds. There's the pre-revenue, there's the angel, there's the seed one, there's the seed two, the average amount of money that is raised by startups before they raise a Series A is over $8 million uh, Canadian and often done in three rounds. Right here. To your left. 
Yeah. Zach from Lubio. Um, thanks, Caitlin. So as you've continued to go more up market, focus more on enterprise, deal sizes get bigger, um, your customers tend to have a lot more demand for you and kind of try to dictate your roadmap more and more. How have you navigated that and balanced as you've kind of gone more and more up market? So we're still learning this. Um, it's a word called co-creation. And you pick, you know, three customers that have the honor to co-create with you and you build a relationship and you don't commit to a two-year roadmap, you say, you know what? We're gonna create user stories together. We're gonna figure out what your needs are, and we're gonna communicate, and that's gonna help inform our roadmap. But a lot of the time, it's us going in and educating them. This is what the majority of our customers are hearing. Can you validate that that resonates with you? Can you help us tweak? And so we try to bring them into the process and make them feel like, Enterprises don't sign up for a year. I mean, they do right away, but their goal is they want to grow with you over the next five. So you try to make it relationship-based and try to show that we're growing together. They don't actually expect you to deliver things overnight. I found that it's the small businesses or the medium-sized businesses that expect the easy button, everything to be perfect, and they want it to be turned around tomorrow, that they're far more demanding in that respect than enterprises. They know things take time. One more question. I have one here. Hi, my name is Aaron. I just have a quick question. So I run a business incubator. That's just my passion in a back home, in my home country. So one of the things we are trying to figure out is that what are the things we should look at startups when we want to fund them? What did you learn from your experience when people were looking to fund you? So I do believe that um, companies that have the right team, that have a remarkable idea, they may not get it right, right out of the gate. So I believe investing in somebody that has the potential to persevere until they figure it out. And I think that we get obsessed with, if you haven't figured it out within the first two years, if you're not a rocket ship within three years, you're not investable. I think it takes a lot longer. And so it's really distinguishing between the ones that have the perseverance to just grind it out until they figure it out. I would say, you know, we were too early to market in too crowded of a space, but we always had something that we knew could beat the competition. And it wasn't until we were in the enterprise space that we were able to truly break out from the competition and show that we uniquely could serve an enterprise need that others couldn't. But it took us, if you take from the day I stopped taking a salary to when that breakout happened, I mean, product market fit, we've had lots of them along the way. And I still think we're, you know, there's another year before we have another breakout. So I just think that you've got to really invest in, do they have the potential to figure it out and persevere until they do? And, and that's a really good start. Thank you. Thank you.